convoy of trucks, shovels and bulldozers which has shattered the usual tranquility of Elibana is nevertheless a saviour for some local residents. Seven houses nestled between Bariki Road and the waterfront are being torn apart as the land slips away from underneath them. The landslide was first noticed by residents 11 years ago after torrential rain from the cyclone of May 1974. The slide accelerated really during further heavy people. rain two years ago. The so residents exactly thought a mine under their properties was the cause, but the mine subsidence board denied liability. In March 84, the residents went to council and a deal was struck. The council agreed to carry out a geotechnical survey of the land if residents contributed part of the cost. As a result, engineers decided to dig away some of the clay bed of the lake and replace it with much heavier and more stable slag. When the work is finished in eight weeks' time, the landslip should have stopped. However, residents will receive no compensation for the damage to their homes and will have to pay for the cost of repairs. Yeah, I've had a lovely trot, Lou, you know, and it's uh, good for the stable, I think, for the staff, you know, for the work they've put in, you know, they've, uh, they've enjoyed it too, you know, it's been good. Good yeah. team effort. Yeah. I guess the jockeys you've used a lot of times, Stuart Plain, of course, your good apprentices won the, the apprentices title, Alan Robinson, as you say, it boosts everyone in the stable, Yeah, it, it does, yeah, it makes them all that more cooner, yeah. yeah what good. about next year now? You're going in with a pretty handy string at the moment too? Yeah, I am, Lou, I've got a lovely team of horses coming up, you know, and uh, I think with Crossroads and Lord Underley and... I suppose Nimble Touch and Nature Splendour, you know, you might look forward to winning a nice race for one of them, yeah. Yeah. Nimble Touch has been your, what, most successful in the, within this region in this year? Yeah, well, he's won eight straight, Lee. He's been a great help to me, you know. He's, uh, Puts he's the race on nine. the Sunday table yeah. when they start winning, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's been good. Paul, you came from being a jockey into being a trainer, Ooh. and I guess you've put your lifetime into, in, into horses. Uh, the industry seems to be flourishing at the moment. Right, oh, it is, Lee, yeah. Yeah, it is, it really is. I think... Uh, with Newcastle here putting their wood, wood chip track in and that, you know, it's going to be a terrific training centre here. It'll be one of the best in Australia, I'd say, once they get that. Yeah. So this area can only enhance its reputation in training circles? Yeah, I'm sure it will do. Kello is seen here on the left of the ousted President Abote, whom he helped to restore to power five years ago. 
The 71-year-old army commander now says Obote turned Uganda into a country of blood. In Belfast, a huge IRA bomb has exploded in the city centre, injuring a policeman and damaging buildings over a wide area. The bomb was planted outside a court building. And American actor Rock Hudson is today being flown home from a Paris hospital where doctors have given up hope of saving his life. Friends of the 59-year-old actor chartered a jumbo jet equipped with an intensive care unit at a cost of $250,000. Hudson, who has been receiving treatment for AIDS, is expected to be admitted to a Los Angeles medical centre. The transformation of this site adjacent to the Tomago Motor Drone has been underway since February and by the first week of September it should be fully operational and known as the Newcastle Fun City Indy, a recreational and leisure park featuring a scaled down Grand Prix circuit complete with scaled down Formula One cars and a fun park circuit as well with an over the crossover. Around $1 million has been sunk into this, the first stage, and when fully completed in a couple of years, the value of the complex will rise to around $3 million. Latter work will possibly veer away from the raceway attraction, although it will remain the centrepiece. Behind the development is motor drone operator Peter Gerbil, who says a great amount of planning went into duplicating and ensuring from free racing conditions and thrills. I mean, there's no excitement whatsoever in, in driving a car in a straight line, doesn't matter how fast it is. Um, so we had to combine the, uh, the hard cornering with the uh, braking. Uh, every thrill you would get if you were driving a full bred race car and uh, because of the type of cars we have got uh, they can provide that but then we had to make sure that the track was uh, adequate so we uh, we tightened it up we modified it in fact we changed our mind about four times till we were quite happy to the concept of the track and it now provides S's it provides sharp curves and speedway curves and and uh, just about anything you could hope to get if you were driving a, uh, a Formula One race car in a big race. To back up the racing, there's this magnificent computer which, using laser beams, identifies the cars, times them, and as well as showing a lap time for the 500 metre course, will also vocalise a witty comment on the driver's performance in future as a Grand Prix racer or lack thereof. Car Get the lead out of your boot. It's called cosmetic camouflage, and the Red Cross believes their new service in Newcastle will help a lot of people with disfigurements such as birthmarks, scars, skin pigmentation problems and varicose veins become more comfortable in public. The service uses various cosmetic products to cover up a person's problem area. In the demonstration we received, they showed some of their techniques on a footballer with a black eye. Other cases during the day involved one person with an artificial ear and another with scars from an operation on their finger. The service will operate once every three or four weeks and is free of charge and private. The staff running the service do so on a voluntary basis and are trained in cosmetic camouflage. They say the service will help people with disfigurements not only physically but also psychologically. So many people get frightened, intimidated by their uh, not by their look so much, but by something wrong in their face, their neck, their shoulders, uh, tattoo marks, anything at all. The point is, I, we see it as volunteers, they're really helping people to get out and face the world again, and I think that's what it's all about. Students from the Waratah Orthopaedic School are taking part in a six-week well, course that could literally fire, change their lives. Can. It's all part of the government's participation and, uh, in equity program. Sorry. And the LINK course, designed to make the transition between secondary and tertiary education easier, has been yeah. welcomed with open arms that, by okay. the students. I think they're very important in giving the children um, an outlet for their um, interests for teaching them something about what they could possibly do when they've finished their um, basic education at the special school. Your name? 
This computer course, which is being conducted by the Hamilton Tate College, is intended to whet the appetite, and it seems to have done the trick with Waratah Orthopaedic School captain, Troy Barrow. I think these PEP courses are very good. Um, we wouldn't have much opportunity of getting the courses as such. Now that you've, you've had a little bit of experience with the computers, do you hope to follow it on as a career? Yeah, very much so, I would. Today his contribution was recognised when the general manager of NIB Health Funds, Colin Rogers, presented him with the Achiever Award. This was in the form of plane tickets to enable him to attend the 38th International Emergency Care Association Conference in Florida later this month. Sergeant Anforth said he was delighted by the award. I'm thrilled actually and I feel quite humble that I have been chosen by the uh, people of this region. But however, we are recognised very, very strongly outside the area. So much so that uh, even our National Disaster College at Mount Masson has recognised this region as the leaders throughout Australia and the Southern Hemisphere in rescue and disaster planning. Are you expecting more consultation with overseas rescue units in the future? Well, I'm hoping that this will be the lead-in to that situation, that we have kept ourselves very much isolated in the area. We're hoping out of this that this will be the lead-in, and of course we might even see them out here in a few years' time holding this conference. And I can, I wonder why, you know, over a period of time there hasn't been many more members uh, within our area, but we're hoping out of this that this will be the lead-in, and of course we might even see them out here in a few years' time holding this conference. There are a few regularly competing racehorses who've seen as many birthdays as the horse that's known at Broadmeadow as the old veteran. Chris and Sunsmoke, he's 12 years in horse terms, or 84 in human years. And that makes him possibly the oldest horse that still lines up at the gates regularly. Apart from those few extra carrots with his dinner, he couldn't help thinking the veteran had seen too many birthdays to care about these things anymore. Maybe his mind was off in the hills and ranges of Gloucester, where he was born. Today a few of his friends gathered to celebrate the occasion, and the wise old fella passed on a few of his secrets to longevity. Even though his next start is not until Monday at Randwick, the veteran sticks to the rules. There's no booze when you're training. And for Smokey, it's that sort of attitude that's been one of his secrets. His record speaks for itself. Out of 112 starts, he's only been out of the money 12 times. Trainer Robin Hoisted speaks volumes of Sunsmoke and says there's one handy trick to get results from him in that big race. Well, the owner reckons that uh, when, he, when they give the bad press to him in Sydney, he just rips that bit out of the paper and shows it to him and the old bloke gets his teeth up and grinds his teeth and just shows them they're wrong. And he's 12 years old now. How many more races, how many more years of racing do you think he's got in him? Oh, probably another 12. The ambulance headquarters were broken into during the so-called dog watch shift from 11 o'clock at night to 7am. The thieves searched the building for money and broke into the upstairs pay office, but their efforts netted no money and the only things they left with were two carrying cases containing the resuscitation training torsos. The torsos are part of the ambulance's project restart to train people in life-saving techniques and are worth just $500 each. Ambulance men believe the thieves didn't know what they were taking. The thing that the officers find most upsetting is not the monetary loss, but the loss of these vital training aids. The mannequins uh, are worth in the vicinity of $1,000 uh, for the two, but uh, perhaps that's not what we're looking at in this case. I think it's the value of these uh, particular items in training members of the public in CPR. And when you look at the 1,200 people that we have trained uh, using these mannequins over the last three years, you can easily see the, uh, the value of them. 
And how hopeful are you of getting the mannequins back? Well, I suppose I hope the people that have taken them uh, realise uh, the loss to the ambulance service and the people of uh, Newcastle as well. Renee Copper is fresh from the fashion houses of Paris, where members of Intercoffure met to observe the latest hairdressing techniques. The verdict is Australian men and women are much more casual than their European counterparts. I think Australia is more casual than Europe is. Like the European women are more classical, more elegant. So they have more time to spend going to salons, whereas the Australian women, they are more into um, working so they need something easier to handle. So what is going to um, happen, it's got to have um, either body or it's got to be cut in such a way that it doesn't need much care. And for those people who've never quite come to grips with the more flamboyant styles that have emerged in recent years, the good news is they're on the way out. The flamboyance is, um, it always comes into um, hairdressing when there isn't a direction and the flamboyance is there to help us find a direction. You know, so it goes crazy for a while and then it settles down and that's what's happening now. It's settling down into a more feminine look. There's still a lot of colour, but the colour isn't so outrageous. It's got a softer feel to it. The passing out parade for the new members of 26 Squadron was complete with a fly past by a Mirage and one of the new RAAF Hornets. The four women and six men have successfully completed basic recruit training and are now fully fledged reservists. Ducks of the unit was aircraft woman Karen Davis who received a perpetual trophy from the Dunkirk Association. Members of the unit will now take up duties outside their normal employment in fields such as transport, catering and secretarial work. Federated Iron Workers Association, which covers the striking men, says the water supply to the blast works areas is contaminated by oil and other unidentified substances, making it unfit to drink. Night shift staff asked the company to supply soft drinks until the problem was solved. According to the FIA, the company refused. The strike has stopped all steelmaking until the men return at 7am tomorrow. Later in the morning, the union will have talks with the company over the dispute, which the FIA says has already cost the HP three quarters of a million dollars. Dennis last patrol on Newcastle Harbour on board the Air Force Search and Rescue Shark Tank. The SAR unit, as it's called, operates for both Air Force planes and civilian craft. Dennis has been based in Newcastle since 1969 and reflected today on some of his most memorable moments. He joined the Air Force at the age of 26 after deciding to do something with his life. He's seen the introduction of radar and electronic search equipment in his time, the old 63-footers, as they were known, were replaced for more modern and faster boats. But on his last day, Dennis also found time to speculate on the future of the Air Force Marine branch. One can't say that um, we'll be replaced by larger uh, helicopters, or even for that matter by um, civilian involvement. It's very much a case of, if we had in this country uh, 300 million people, then we would have the money to have all the UBU or singing or dancing type equipments, but we don't have that. We have 14 million people, so we have to spend our money prudently and get the equipment and stuff that we need. So therefore, in the current day and age, I think this marine section will go for a number of years yet.